So greetings, everyone, and uh, it's my pleasure, uh, Bishop Mark Hageman here, to have uh, the NET team, actually one of many NET teams in our country, and this particular team is the team that is ministering in Kuwait and La Paz diocese, and as many of you know, Kuwait and La Paz is an archdiocese in the northern part of both Saskatchewan and in Manitoba, that the Diocese of Saskatoon has been kind of entered into a bit of a relationship with over the last couple of years in terms of ministry and learning and, and working together. And so um, maybe what I'll do to begin is to ask each of the NET members who are joining us from the PA, Manitoba, to introduce themselves. You might as well begin, Maria. Yeah, sure. So my name is Maria. Um, I'm 20 years old and I'm from North Vancouver, BC. Um, this is my second year serving with Net Canada. So I was serving on the Calgary team last year and now I'm here in the fall. Okay. My name is Matt. Matthew and I'm from Saskatoon originally. So I know Bishop Mark. Um, and I am 21 years old. This is my third year serving as a Net missionary. And uh, Yep. <laughs> well said. Uh, my name's Jacob. I'm 23 and I'm from Halifax. And this is my fourth year with NET. And fun fact about me is every winter we used to jump into the, the harbor. And so there's a couple of years that we had to break the ice when we were jumping in on uh, New Year's morning. That was chilly. <laughs> That's going to be easy. <laughs> Go ahead, Fernanda. Oh. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, so my name is Fernanda. I am 23 years old. I'm from Nova Scotia. And this is my fourth year serving with Net Ministries. And I really enjoy coffee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, especially in these winter days. Well, welcome to you all. And it's really great to have you join us. And and uh, yeah, the purpose of this is, uh, well, not only to learn about your ministry with Kiwait and La Pa, and uh, it's great to have a son of Saskatoon as part of the team, but you're all uh, sons and daughters of the church, so we're all in this together. And uh, But this is a, a very extraordinary time, not only in where you're at and where I'm at uh, in terms of our dioceses, but in the world, with the pandemic going on and everything, and, and people are, golly, they're, they're blindsided increasingly by these series of supports or things they could count on that, that slowly are not there. And then um, we're getting ready for a, a Christmas season that, uh, you know, will be very different from what, what we've ever celebrated before, probably in most of our lifetimes. So, um, but I think the good Lord... Uh, it will speak to us loudly through this. And so this is an opportunity to reflect on that as a message of sharing and hope uh, for our dioceses and beyond. So maybe I, I could ask each of you, how has COVID-19 affected you um, in terms of your own life and maybe how you're trying to minister uh, with the NET team in Kiwait and La Paz Archdiocese? I, uh, so I lost my job or... I stopped working, wasn't able to find a job because of COVID. Hmm. And at the time I was living in Vancouver and my life just slowed down. And I found I had so much time and no idea what to do with it. Um, so then once I found out that I was gonna be doing ministry this year, I then decided to move home to Halifax where I got to spend the summer with my family. And we had so much um, time just to spend as family, bonding, time together and I really appreciated that. Like it was really good for me and it was really good for my family too, just for us all to be together, spending so much time together. Um, so I was really, really grateful for that, but also just in learning to be more quiet and just at peace with, with stillness because I like to act like a busybody, always being, always doing something. And that's kind of a way that I maintain a peace. But all of a sudden I didn't have things to distract me anymore. So I was able to really reflect on my life and focus more on my life spiritually because of that. So after I was working with Net Ministries up to um, July, I believe, and then 
after that, I went home for a break between, between the years. And for me, what happened was that my sister was actually, she was, for her, she was planning to get married that summer. And since everything, it was just a lot of uncertainties and restrictions with the, with the province, um, the wedding just kept getting pushed back and pushed back. And so that was a very huge like, concern um, uh, for like the whole family throughout the summer. And there was just one day, they just decided to just like hungry down with one date. And all of the summer in my like me being home, which is like leading up to this wedding day. And it turned out to be so beautiful, um, regardless of like how many people were able to be there, regardless of like the registrations that we had to follow. Um, it just kind of showed that um, life keeps going. Uh, we need to work with it, with what we have. And it, that won't keep away from being family or becoming family with a new family um, for uniting people. And so that was a huge, a huge thing that I saw in everything like my family. And yeah, I'm just so blessed to be been able to be part of it. Um, and so now in my personal life, I think it's just being open to quick changes and adaptability and just working with, with the boundaries that we have um, and not forgetting to reach out to other people to stay connected. Um, in terms of the first question, so really quickly, like I think one of the ways COVID affected me the most is in the sense that my first net year was actually cut short by COVID. Um, so our team, yeah, we went up until March instead of May. And so we all went home in mid-March um, when COVID kind of started picking up. And because of that, I think it left for like, there, there was a lot of opportunities for creative license and imagination to come forth when it comes to doing ministry. So like it was hard to leave the people that we were ministering to behind, but at the same time we were able to come up with a bunch of different ways to continue ministering to them while we were at home. So like we started up online small groups with the youth group that we had in Calgary. Um, and so in that sense, it was really beautiful to see how we could continue the ministry. Um, and it's a similar way into what we've been doing here. I'm just trying to find ways of reaching out to people online and reaching out to yeah, to the different communities in that way so that we can still maintain that contact with them and still get to know them and just in a slightly different way than in person. But, yeah. Okay, well, thanks, Maria. Well, Matthew, haven't heard from you yet. Uh, so I was working in apprenticeship for a uh, plumber in Saskatoon. And um, when COVID first started affecting North America more heavily, uh, we stopped working for a bit, so I had a lot more free time on my hands, and it gave me a lot of time for reflection and um, just kind of working on my own creative pursuits with my younger brother, um, and my younger brother had actually done a year of Net Canada, and his year was also cut short along with Maria's, and so he came home, and yeah, we had lots of time to spend together, which I hadn't had for a while because um, of doing net two years previously. So it was nice to be together as a family again. It was pretty strange not going to mass on Sundays and having things closed down a bit. Um, but I was able to help out with live streaming at our home parish at Our Lady of Lourdes. So that was a really big, a really big blessing um, to be involved in that way. And um, yeah, kind of helped me reevaluate where I was going in life and what I wanted to do. And um, yeah, I got the call about doing that again and doing that here in the Kiwait and La Pau diocese. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a different trajectory than I was expecting. I was expecting just to go back to work, uh, which I did go back to work for a little bit, but then came, came here to net. And uh, it's been, again, another life changing experience. And yeah, the ministry here has been very interesting because we only heard like two days before we were commissioned as a team that we would not be able to go visit the communities that we were going into. Mm -hmm. um, and our plan was to go in and build leaders in those communities so that when NET was no longer present there, the leadership would continue and youth ministry would uh, remain vibrant and um, self-sustained. So it was pretty crushing to hear that we couldn't go into the communities. Um, so 
we've kind of been making do with what we've got here in the PAW and doing a lot of intercessory prayer for our communities and uh, working on um, some online um, retreats and workshops and a lot of online adoration and online uh, rosaries as well. So it's been not what I expected, but uh, beautiful in its own way. So. Okay. May I, may I ask, would you say that uh, the, the activities that you would have done, you're able to do, albeit virtually, or has uh, being sort of separated from visiting the communities really changed the activities that NET would normally do when you go to communities and train leadership as you outline there? Um, it's forced us to be creative, that's for sure, because a lot of what we would do would normally be in person, and in-person ministry is what seemed to have worked best in the past. But I think what's something that's cool about what we're here this year for with building leaders is a lot of that can be done online. So we just, we're working on ways to explore that avenue and uh, better utilize the online aspect. Because, yeah, with COVID, it's kind of forced everyone to figure out how to do things differently. And I don't think we're any different. We just kind of have to navigate this new field. So, okay. You know, the lack of personal ministry, the lack of personal relationship is has been one of the biggest effects of of trying to mitigate the spread of the of the of the virus. And um, I, I'm wondering if we could go with that a little bit, uh, you know, with the next question. And, uh, you know, uh, many people are commenting that uh, while the pandemic has really affected their lives and uh, and really provided some difficult challenges, it's also been the occasion for new awareness, new insights, and maybe opportunities to be aware of things that we don't normally or we're not normally aware of. And um, and I'm, I'm wondering how that's affected you and your ministry. Do you have any sharing on that? Mm -hmm. Well, like our, our hope and, and what we pray for is the ability to, in the future, uh, be able to actually minister face-to-face, -face, right? Because sure. we, like you said, like, it ha this has allowed for people to really realize um, what they've been able to take for granted in terms of, I think, especially just relation relating to people, just being with people, being with friends, being with family. Um, and in some ways, it's like inspired greater connections in those areas. Um, but in other ways, it's really allowed us to, to know how much we need and rely on community. Um, so there's always that yearning, especially in our hearts, to be able to go out and make those connections. Um, but we're doing like everything in best prudence in terms of what we can right now. So that just means not going out and not going to these communities. However, that means praying for them more, which is arguably more effective. Um, but uh, one of the graces that we've got to experience and relative to that, to having community is living with the four people um, who live in the bishop's house with us. So like the rector of the cathedral, um, the vicar general, uh, bishop himself, and then the youth coordinator for the diocese, we get to live with the four of them. And so the eight of us, we all live together, we all eat together, um, we watch TV, um, watch sports, movies, uh, play games together, lots of cards. And so it's been really, really great fellowship. Um, <laughs> And, and I was like, uh, I think it was Matthew was mentioning, someone was mentioning that we pray a lot. We've been doing a lot of prayer. And most of that is communal with the whole household. And so when you look at that situation, like if it wasn't for COVID, we wouldn't be able to be having those relationships. We wouldn't be per se stuck in this house, being able to make these connections and live in fellowship. So um, yeah, it's really shown me how much I love and rely on community and those relationships, but it's also given me a unique opportunity to experience them. Okay. Thank you for that. That's, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the inability to reach out to many communities has kind of been the occasion for you to be a part of a particular community. That's a, a, a great message. Thank you. Any other reflections on this? 
I think just like one cool little thing that's happened with my family is that my dad's family down in the States, we usually only visit them once a year, but we've kind of, well, since before I left, I've had like weekly calls with them. So it's, I think it's brought a lot of families that were further apart, closer together in, in some sense, um, even though we can't physically be with each other necessarily, that um, it's just kind of revealed that we have a lot of technology at our disposal, disposal to use for good. Technology is a tool that can be used for good or evil, but there's like, there's a lot of opportunities right now to use it for good. So I think that's been a revelation I've had. Mm -hmm. Adding on to what Matthew was just saying, like I can I can second that and relate to that. As soon as as soon as COVID hit, um, back in March, my yeah my family on my mom's side also started doing these like weekly Zoom calls on Sunday, and so like it's yeah it's been able to foster relationships that we wouldn't normally have with them otherwise. They live in Mexico, like we live in Vancouver, so like, and we wouldn't speak to them that much at all. Um, so in terms of family and community, it's certainly. It's limited it in some cases for families who aren't able to see each other because of it, but in other cases, it's also, I would say, increased it a lot more. Um, and yeah, there's been a real beauty to that, I think. Um, but yeah. Okay. You know, what? as you guys were speaking, a scripture uh, came to mind, you know, and it's the struggle that the disciples had when Jesus, who had been such a part of their, their reality and their relationship for so many years, all of a sudden ascended, and they didn't want him to go. And, and uh, they said, Lord, you know, they wanted to hold on to him. And uh, he said, you, you, you can't hold on to me unless I go, you know, and ascend to my father. The, the Holy Spirit can't come upon you, and he will reveal to you and show you all that you need to know. And I kind of feel like we're at a new point of that. I experienced that in my life where, you know, I, I see all the, the responsibilities and the opportunities and the work of ministry. And I, I just do it and I grind it out. And all of a sudden, that's been a profound pause. And I'm kind of forced to reflect on not only how I do things, but I can't do some things. And, I, and I've, I've got to look at some new things. And, uh, and part of it is, is allowing the Lord to inspire me in new ways, which means I, I need to stop and listen. And who would have thought that uh, the effect of mitigating the COVID virus would mean um, kind of more about doing less versus more and re reflecting on kind of these questions of uh, how am I doing in my relationship with the Lord as things are pulled away, you know, um, and I'm stripped of certain things I, I count on to kind of feel good about my ministry. I'm doing my work. They're not, they're not there like they used to be. Um, my profound new community is the community here at the pastoral center. You know, we're, we're, you know, we're doing our distancing and wearing our masks, but you know, we're, we're probably more present here because we have to be than in my three years here in the diocese of Saskatoon. And I can't imagine what it would be like for Archbishop Murray in Kiwaitin or, you know, in, in Mackenzie. All I did was travel. I was going everywhere and all of that has stopped. And uh, yeah, so there's, there's a profound pause that we're all dealing with right now. And, and there's got to be a blessing in that. And so maybe speaking of the blessing, you know, we're about to uh, approach another Christmas. And so, you know, we're already hearing in parts of Canada, like British Columbia and other places that uh, they're limiting people to five to 10 uh, gathering. I mean, um, what are you guys doing differently to get ready for Christmas? And how might your upcoming Christmas be a time of blessing, despite um, what we're dealing with with COVID? Any thoughts on that? I think like one little thing that we're at least doing as a team that we started this Advent is uh, we were just kind of like reflecting together as a team about all the prayer that we were doing. And I think it was, was it Jacob? I think it was Jacob. It brought up that like in the gospels, Jesus says like some things can only be, well, he's talking about casting on demons, but some, some things can only be done with prayer and fasting. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of thought it as a team to take two days a week to just fast until supper time. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's been a good challenge for me at least. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, just, it's kind of, it's helped me see the value of fasting in our everyday life. And that is something that we can, that we can all do right now. Um, uh, and it's, it's a really beautiful way to take on a little bit of suffering for yourself um, and unite it to the Lord's and um, offer it up for, for people who, you know, are not doing as well. And, you know, people who are sick and all that kind of stuff. So that's been one small thing that we've done. And there are a lot of people who are sick. I mean, uh, I was speaking with a, an elder just uh, uh, about an hour ago, and, and she and her husband have been very sick. And uh, the husband was in hospital for a short time. And so we're starting to hear more of the stories of people who are sick but uh, from COVID. But we're also hearing stories of people who are dealing with some profound anxiety, even depression. And, and, that, and that's quite prevalent as well. So, um, you know, thanks for the reminder about some things are only cast out, if you will, with prayer and fasting. Uh, that's a good reflection. And one thing that came to mind, um, and, and a way that I've been preparing differently for Christmas this year, um, not even necessarily by choice, but one thing that's been sticking out to me a lot is the themes for the Advent Sunday. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> like the first Sunday being hope. Um, like how much, how much hope do we need right now, right? In this world, in this condition, um, to just a hope of a better future, hope of, you know, a successful vaccine and hope of people getting better and hope of being able to see our family again. Um, it's easy for us to, to fall into despair and then peace, right? This past Sunday, peace. Um, just talking about how we need to be at peace with the current condition that we're in. Um, and that even though things are difficult, like we find peace in the Lord and not um, this temporary peace that we might get if, if we rely on the world's condition. Um, and then of course, like joy, we need to keep smiling. Um, it's so easy for us to, to get bogged down about the current conditions and about what we're incapable of doing rather than find joy in what we're capable of doing. Um, and then interestingly enough, like the last Sunday with love, um, how I think this is one area we're actually doing really well in, like as a society as a whole. Um, like we're, we're seeing so many opportunities of people who might not be experiencing um, hope, joy, and peace. Um, and we're, we're loving them by, by seeking to help them to, to feel those, by willing the best of them. So like the amount of effort that's gone into show appreciation to our, um, our frontline workers and, and our elderly people who, who don't get to spend time with their family this, this season or might not have a family or might be alone. Um, and just the amount of love that I've seen shown by our culture has been really inspired me. Um, so I haven't reflected on the themes of the Sundays very much leading up until this year, but this year has given me a really great opportunity to do that in preparation for the coming of that word. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Great reminder here of the meaning of the themes in a profoundly different time. Thank you. Something that we've been doing as a, as a team uh, for our ministry, we've been uh, doing a daily rosary and um, making very intentional um, intercessions for people that we've met, um, people who have asked us for prayers. Uh, we create a list and then read them out loud. First name by name, person by person, situation by situation. Um, and something that has been very beautiful is that we've been actually going on walks with like just doing a rosary walk. And um, and some occasions we have encountered people with the sidewalk in like the street, right? And obviously keeping the restrictions and wearing our masks. Um, we had had conversations with them. And so last Sunday, as Jacob was saying, was uh, the theme of peace, right? And we have encountered a couple and uh, that was eschewing and they need help with this too. So we just got a rosary and we just like helped out with where we need to do. Um, and something that he, they asked us like, why are you doing? And we are like, we're praying, praying the rosary and we just, uh, Jacob and I started explaining a little bit and something that um, one of them asked was where is God like where is this God and that got me reflecting that you know like we are like 
that's the chance for like that was a chance for us to be like it got well Matthew answered him actually um but I got me reflecting later on that like we just had to come out of mat like of mass like 30 minutes before and we have witnessed and received our God. We have been in the presence of our God. And that's such a beautiful thing to, to for us to receive and to, for us to stay with us and for us to bring out. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, because we get sent, sent out after mass, right? And so that's what exactly was happening. This person was asking, did not obviously did not have peace in their heart because they were asking like, where is the creator? Where is God? Like I missed all of this, and so hmm. very beautiful. A great mystic <laughs> insight you know, where we receive Christ to bring him to others, and the Lord surprises us with where He sends us and the opportunities He He presents us with to to share His love and His presence. Yeah, right on. Well, let's go to the far west coast, Maria. Um, I think, I think up until now, um, COVID has given me a new sense of appreciation for Advent as a season of waiting and as a season of waiting patiently. Um, because like, yeah, throughout Advent, we're waiting for the coming of our Lord at Christmas, right? And then COVID, the, like through isolation and through all of these restrictions and regulations, has because of that also been kind of its own season of waiting um, and just taking a step back and being able to refocus our thoughts and our minds and just on, on other things that we previously hadn't been able to focus on before. Um, and so in that sense, like thinking about it that way, if Advent ends, like if Advent continues with us waiting patiently and ends with the coming of our Lord, um, then you can also only imagine like when COVID is over as well, after all of this time of waiting patiently um, and sitting through it and learning to grow in joy and hope and peace and love, like where, where we will be coming out of this, right? And how much stronger people will be for it in terms of like together as a society, um, individually as, as families. Um, yeah. And how much, yeah, how much how much better we'll be kind of coming out on the other side, having been through all of this time of waiting um, patiently and growing in all these virtues and growing and supporting one another in that way. Um, and that was just, yeah, I think that's, that's just the parallel that I've seen between this Advent season and upcoming Christmas and the time that we spent during the pandemic. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. You know, as you guys were sharing, I, uh, I've been here in Saskatoon three years. I'm originally from Vancouver, and, uh, and that's where I was a, a priest for most of my priesthood before I, I went to Mackenzie Fort Smith. And, and when I went to Mackenzie in the Northwest Territory, uh, it, this time of the year is profoundly dark. Like even in Yellowknife, where the sun rises, it only rises for a few hours and it's just on the horizon. And then once you get to the Arctic Circle, which is midway up the territory, it's like dark all day and all night. So this time of the year, I've been thinking about this because I go, well, Saskatoon, at least it's um, not quite as dark for most of the day, but it's still dark. Like when I, I leave work and I, I like to run about 6 p.m. Well, it's dark. I got my headlight and I'm watching my footing. And then I finish my run and I look at the darkness and I know that in a few weeks things are going to change and it'll start to get lighter. And that little bit of a thought is just, I, I, I think about the Lord who comes and that the light will always illumine the darkness and, you know, the prophet Isaiah. And of course we hear it in the gospels too. And, and I'm finding COVID is making me think more about the light that will infuse the darkness. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's such a simple little theme, but uh, people are experiencing a lot of darkness right now. But, you know, the light will be all the more potent. I mean, you know, uh, the light will infuse absolutely any darkness. And so I'm looking forward to, to that light when it comes. So that leads me to maybe one more question that we hadn't talked about, but I'll, I'll throw it out there anyway. You know, and 
you know, a, a lot of people are saying, and I agree with this, that, you know, things won't entirely go back to normal the way they were when the pandemic is over. And that may be a good thing in some cases, you know. So I'm wondering, you know, what is one thing you're concerned about when the pandemic is over? And one thing that you might hope changes, that could be a personal change or a larger change. What would you say to an answer to that? <laughs> one thing that comes to my mind is, and I thought about this a little bit, um, a fear that people fall into bad habits of being alone. Um, so just a fear of, of people being like, oh, well, um, I don't really want to see my in-laws this weekend. So I'm just going to decide not to, um, cause like the, the excuse up until this point for doing, for not wanting to see anybody or going anywhere we don't want to go is that there's COVID and it's unsafe for me to do that. And like right now it's a valid excuse. However, like. You know, we have hope that there are times where that's no longer an excuse anymore. Uh, and so my fear is just, yeah. And then as well with like um, going to mass, like right now it's optional. Um, who's like, who's going to be showing up when it's not, when it's obligatory again. Um, and just a fear of not being able to see faces that I'm so used to and faces that I love. Um, but then on the other hand, like you were saying, one thing that, uh, uh, Sorry, the second part of your question, you're saying one thing that we hope happens? Yeah, yeah. like one thing that uh, that you might be concerned about, and, and you've mentioned a few things there, and but something you, you might hope that changes, either in your own life or or in a broader context of what, what we're seeing in the world or, or in our communities right now. I think going back to something that I was talking about before, and, and when you were talking about taking things for granted as community, Right, so almost the exact opposite of what um, I fear might happen is I hope that the opposite happens, uh, and there's a lot of reason for it. So I hope that people spend more time together, that people are more intentional about being together and making sacrifices to be together. Um, like for a lot of people, including myself, this is my first Christmas where I'm not going to be with my family. Hmm. Um, so I can only hope that in the future that people go through greater lengths to be with their family to spend time with people they love, to make an effort to reach out to those who are alone. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways that we've seen people do this, uh, make an effort and just care more about people and want to be with their families. Um, so I just hope that, yeah, as the, as, you know, the world goes back to normal, um, that people take advantage of that, that they realize they've been taking granted of all the opportunities to, to be with each other and that they really uh, capitalize on opportunities to have community. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Hey, I have some concerns about and like things when the world goes back to normal, if it ever does, or whatever the new normal is. But I think I want to focus on the positives of being, like, I think now that we, as a general community or population, have experienced like loneliness and it's become like a, a widespread thing that maybe people who have never been on their own before have now experienced is that people will have a greater empathy for those who are alone mm -hmm. and many many more people will be able to you know say oh I've felt that before okay, I know I know where you're coming from and they'll just I think a, a really big um I don't want to say problem but like an epidemic that's happening is like a lot of older people die alone, um, unwanted or unloved by their own families, or maybe they don't have any family. Um, so I know that's one area in my life I want to work more on is like visiting the sick and the dying mm -hmm. once we're able to more. Um, yeah, just having more of a heart for the lonely and the lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you speak, uh, Matthew, you know, I keep hearing uh, more and more that, you know, I will focus on what is more important, which sounded like, sounds like begging the obvious, but, but then they'll go on to say, I keep hearing from people who um, have been near death or, or reflect on the experience of dying that, you know, when you're going through a real crisis, you don't think of all that you've done 
and you don't think of all, even of all the heroic things you've accomplished, you think about the people you love. And so, uh, you know, the, the call to community and, and to being really human with each other, I, I heard that in both of your comments. Uh, thanks for that. Ladies, what do you think? I honestly think a lot of this has been summed up pretty well already. Um, for me, the biggest thing that I would hope for coming out of this is that people people come out of it with a bigger, with, or with an increased appreciation for, yeah, for community and for family and for being around the people that you love. And yeah, I'm just repeating things that were said, but like just not taking that for granted. Um, because yeah, because the pandemic has made for a lot of has how do I word this? Um, it's it has landed a lot of people in situations where that they may not have expected they would ever have been in. And so I think that yeah, coming out of it, I hope that there is a greater appreciation and a new perspective on on what is really important to people, and that being like yeah, and just hopefully that there's a realization for people of what they hold in higher esteem compared to other things. Something that I hope doesn't end up happening is that people let go of those opportunities that there will be for community once COVID is over um, and that they don't choose to just kind of remain in the way things were during the pandemic um, and that they'll use the opportunity to kind of step out, um, of whether that's like step out of their homes um, and just kind of to continue to love the people around them in the best ways that they can. Um, yeah. Thanks, Maria. How about you, Fernanda? Um, I, was, I was listening, uh, so I was listening, and something came up to really thought about how it's not just going to be like 180 going back to um, a certain lifestyle. Um, that may be different. It's going to be like a transition period. A lot of it, that's just what I'm seeing. And like, I think that transition is going to be needed uh, for a lot of us. I remember this one time where it was my turn to do groceries for my household. And I went out and I went into the grocery store and you know, I was overwhelmed because I haven't had been around like that many people in like a month and a half or two. And so I think that the transition, like now that, um, like transitioning out of um, isolation is gonna be a time to walk with people. Uh, it's gonna be a time of you no, know, like going back and being like, okay, so where, who am I centered in? Who am I rooted in? And, you know, like just seeing or remembering like who is our savior, like, and he, that he has been, through it and that he's going to be walking with us through, through this time of like transitioning. Um, yeah, that's what I'm seeing at. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Well, thank you. If I could share one thing very briefly, uh, you know, one of the things that concerns me is that, you know, um, I, I'm kind of an intentional living kind of guy. That's the kind of the way I've been for most of my life. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I have a very structured life. Um, part of that is just the part of the lifestyle of ministry that I face. But part of it, too, is building in, you know, time of prayer, time of exercise, time of, of you know, uh, important things I need to do in terms of personal reading and, and relationships and outreach, all of these things. And, um, and, and so life is really, really full. And so I find over the years, I've tried to got to get better at doing more things as more things keep coming at me. And so COVID has kind of messed that up. It's pulled it away. And there's some like, like this is kind of okay. I kind of needed this kind of piece to this right now. Um, I mean, even on my street, uh, Matthew knows that I live near the cathedral, uh, near Mother Teresa Elementary School. And, you know, for the first two and a half years, I never met anybody on my street and then beginning this summer, I started meeting people like I'd never met before because everybody was on this giant pause 
and they had to walk in their neighborhood. So I'd finish my run and they go, how come you're running again? And then it would start a conversation and, you know, <laughs> and I, you know, and, 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 and so I know most of the people on my street, really that's only happened because of the issues imposed to us on by COVID. So one of the things I hope for is that um, I, I find one of the temptations when you think you're doing well is to do more things better. And I, I think I think the call post COVID for me is maybe sometimes to do fewer things kind of profoundly well. And profoundly well means, you know, being open to kind of having the patience to see where God works in that, you know, and not assuming what that will be and then move on to the next task. So we'll see how that goes. Anything else that you I haven't asked or we haven't talked about that you want to finish off with as a profound insight or a big question or whatever? So um, as, a, as, a, as a team, uh, we take two, well, we, we get commissioned. And when we get commissioned, uh, there's two saints that get how would you say? assigned to us. Yeah, assigned to us. So uh, we, like, we find out their names. So this year is St. Saint Helena and Venerable Bishop Charlevoix. So he's the, he was the first vicared bishop uh, vicar, sorry. Yeah, his, yeah, he was the first vicar bishop. Mm -hmm. anyway, he was the guy who was here with the diocese. <laughs> and <laughs> he was like pretty much the first bishop of Kiwi Inupa. And you just hear about this epic story of him like traveling miles and miles and like called it portages, portage, and like hiking and sleeping in a tent like for 60 nights and just like amazing. Um, and he also like, so we were learning more about his life as we went here. And one of the things that was very surprising to, to me and then also to the team um, was that he was one of the bishops that asked other bishops to write letters. So to name St. Therese of Lisieux, Lisieux? I can't speak French. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, to be the patron, uh, the patroness of missions, of missionaries of missions. And he was so, uh, such an advocate for it. And so we had kind of have like adopted St. Therese as one of our, well, I have adopted St. Therese <laughs> as one of our team saints because like she was just a like 17th century French nun that was. In a, like away from mission, right? And she just prayed. And so that was such a testament to like when we first got here and we're like, okay, we don't have like face to face ministry. So what else can we do besides online ministry is prayer. And so she's been such a testament to us, like um, to like the, the power of prayer, the power of ministry through prayer and intercession. Um, so that's since there's such a beautiful like witness to me. And then to find out that um Bishop Charlewell was like such an advocate for her is just amazing. Uh -huh. Like the connections like nonstop. <laughs> and then we found some relics oh, oh. Yeah. 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 They've found relics uh, in the basement. What's that? They have tons of relics of Saint Therese in the basement of the um of the bishop's house. So we've been yeah. admiring that. <laughs> Wow. Well, you know, I think, yeah, St. Therese uh, probably is, uh, is, is going to be a very meaningful saint and example for many people because of what's been imposed by COVID. And uh, yeah, the little way and uh, the fact, as you say, you know, uh, patron saint of, of missionary work and look at the particular way and little way she lived uh, and yet had such a profound impact. Uh, there's lots of lessons in that for us right now during this time. So yeah, I, I can see why that would have an impact on you, Fern. Yeah. Any other last uh, insights or? Yeah, I want to relay what Fern was saying um, and what the theme of my life has been since we got here a couple months ago was never forget the power of prayer. Hmm. And remembering that and seeing that has changed my life. Um, like we've been, we've been pretty much praying anytime we're not doing ministry. Um, by preparing ministry online, preparing materials, or just spending time with our household, we've been praying. Um, we spend something like 
three hours a day in prayer just as a team um, in our household, something like that. And then like that's inside of our own personal prayer. I don't know. It's a lot. It's a lot of prayer. Um, that's a lot of prayer. Yeah. And things have been happening. And it's incredible. And we often forget that because we're not working with something. I used to be a carpenter. So I'm used to putting in my work into something and then having like the result in my hands and being able to see it, it being so tangible. And with prayer, that's really difficult. However, never forget like the power of it. It's, it's more effective than, you know, you know uh, us going out and, and, and uh, being these, these missionaries, um, these examples within these communities. And that's why St. Therese is the patroness of mission. Um, like we've seen miraculous healing from our prayers. Things have been happening and it's all come from us like trusting in God and realizing the power of prayer. So I just, that's something that we can all do, right? That we can all do from home. Um, every one of us, like we're, none of us are excluded from, from that. It is being bold in our prayer, asking for the things that we actually want and praying for it with confidence and praying for it every day, praying for it often because the Lord wants to do good things in our lives. He wants to use us. So why are we not giving him the opportunity to do that through prayer? A great, great insight. Thanks, thanks, Jacob. You know, I, I, I find increasingly there are days when I don't know what to pray for in terms of the outcome for a particular issue, and, and when I give myself to prayer, the Lord can shape my heart so that He can use me according to His plan. Uh, but I don't know what that plan is. So yeah, I, the power in prayer works in ways. We expect and don't expect. And uh, uh, thanks for that witness. So why don't we conclude with a prayer, and then uh, we'll we'll finish this up, and then uh, and then go from there. I'll begin, and then you guys join in. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, thank you so very much for our lives, and for the the, the blessings that you bestow on us. And, and for the opportunity you give us to share in your life and your love. And pray for each and every one of these young men and women, a part of the net team of Kuwait and La Pa, and, and indeed all the net teams uh, everywhere, that you will continue to bless and lead them in this extraordinary time. And continue to open their minds and their hearts to your plan for their lives and, and also to the people that they minister with. Because... Uh, when we go forward in ministry, we find uh, there's more ways that people minister to us than we minister to them. But ultimately, Lord God, you are the source of all life and blessing and continue to show us your way, your truth, and your light. And as we are in this Advent season, may we continue to, to long for your light that infuses our darkness. In a special way, we pray for healing from the pandemic and for those who are really sick and struggling with the pandemic. And we thank you for those you put into our lives to be caregivers and, and, and who service us in a profound way during these difficult times. Thank you, Lord, and bless you for all your love and your light. Lord, we also just pray for our supporters, uh, for our families, uh, for those people who um, have prayed for us and have worked so this ministry can continue. We also pray for all the other ministries who have been working um, alongside, and we just ask to continue to give us the strength, um, the knowledge, and the wisdom to follow you. Lord, I pray for all those who are alone during this time, who are isolated and sick, and I just pray for healing for them, and that you would be a comfort, and uh, put people in their lives that can minister to them and witness to them. Lord, we, we, we see you through your example as you lived your life of poverty, that virtue comes through poverty. And so we thank you so much for the gift of having social poverty now so that we can experience the virtues that come with that and the ways that you're trying to work into our lives, Lord, we welcome those. And we pray especially for the communities that we are intended to minister to this year. We also pray for a continued increase in growth in 
throughout this Advent season um, in peace and joy and hope and in love. Um, and for just a continued outpouring of your blessings and your graces, um, for all the openness to your will, um, that your will be done now throughout this Advent season coming up on Christmas. Um, and that we continue to see your fruit as the year goes on. And may the Lord bless us, show us his way, and keep us in his care always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, great to uh, meet and share with you today, and blessings to you all as you bring your time uh, at, at Kiwain and La Pa to a close, at least for this part of the season, as you journey home to family and others for the Christmas break, and then as you return uh, in January, and very good to connect with you all, and, and thank you for your sharing. Thank you for having us, Bishop.